Uh, hola, buenos días. Uh, mi nombre es Stuart Taylor. Uh, now I go back to English. <laughs> I, am, I am trying to learn. Okay, as uh, Miguel introduced me, I am Stuart Taylor. I'm the EAMDAR technical coordinator. I also have a role within WMO, the World Net Organization, as the AMDAR development officer trying to develop in other regions of the globe, as you'll see on the maps to come. I'm also presenting this on behalf of Steve Stringer, who is the EAMDAR program manager who should have been doing this presentation, but I was roped in to do it because he's not available. So what I want to do is give you an overview of AMDAR, the EAMDAR program. Why do we need the aircraft data, the impacts and benefits? How do we get aircraft observations? A bit on what is EAMDAR? What an airline needs to do to participate in the EAMDAR program? And I look at other aircraft-based observation platforms, the MODES, uh, MRAR data, AREPS, ADSC data, AFERS. Uh, I haven't got the TAMDAR on this slide, but I can provide that at a later date. And also some examples of uh, aircraft-based observations in wind shear forecasting. So this is a global picture of AMDAR data. As you can see, it's a one-day snapshot, 24 hours. And we have regional global programs. We have US, Canada. We have LATAM in South America. The EAMDAR, the European Pro Project. South Africa. We have China, Hong Kong, China, Korea, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand. Hopefully, we'll be starting off a Kenya project in East Africa as well. AMDAR data itself, uh, over the last uh, 10 years or so, has increased uh, rapidly. Uh, what we really need to look at is the black solid line here. And we're up around 800,000 observations a day from the airlines uh, and the global projects. So here we have just, uh, as I mentioned, the, the programs down the side here. And we have the number of airlines participating in the project. In the EAMDA, we have 14 airlines currently. We are a collaboration within Europe, not just a, a, a national Met service uh, project, but a collaboration. So what is UMetNet? This is the European Meteorological Network. It's 31 European members, all with their national Met services. Uh, there is three programs within the UMetNet, observations, forecasting, and climate. And this is where EAMDAR sits, the, the OBS program. We also have, oh, wrong one. We also have uh, balloons from ships, uh, uh, water vapor, e-profiles, and LIDAR. Uh, Surf Mar, which is the ships and boys reporting, and Opera, which is the weather radars. This is a typical uh, snapshot of one day of the EAMDAR program coverage. And what we have here is what we call the UCOS, that's the European Composite Observing System box. That's the domain where we are funded to provide data. Anything outside this box is in support of regional programs or part of the World Weather Watch program for WMO. Uh, zooming into Europe, we can start to see uh, the colouring of each airline. For example, SAS is the light blue, predominantly over Scandinavia. Uh, Air France, the red. Uh, EasyJet is this so orange. Uh, black is Lufthansa. And purple is Finnair, for example. So what we actually do within the AMDA program, we have got optimization, So we can actually select the, the flight that we want at each airport. Whereas other programs, they just have the aircraft switch on for reporting. So we, as I said, we are funded by UMetNet to provide this data in the domain area. And it's, a, it's not limitless. We have a certain fixed amount. So we have to pay for the data procurement, the data communication costs, and all the, the other costs that we have with the airlines. Uh, one of the, one of, what we do is we, we, we measure wind and, wind and temperature data using the existing sensors on board and the infrastructure. One of the things we're actually doing now is uh, developing and reporting humidity, which is another sensor which we have to, to get cert certification for. And an airline has to agree to drill a hole in their aircraft and fit this sensor for us. It's a long process, as you can imagine. So humidity is one of the most significant parameters for weather evolution. Uh, improvements to aviation meteorological products can be expected from humidity uh, reporting, convection, precipitation, the fog forming and clearance forecasts, and 
increasing the reliability of the short and long-term weather prognosis. Improvements to aviation met products will have effects on flight safety, airport operations, the flow control, and the operation optimization of the start landing frequency. Uh, most airports operate a 3,000 foot wind approach. All your armed air aircraft are coming in. That data is there, it's in real time, it's fed back to your traffic so they can actually look at the flow control as well. That's the, the sensor. It's a small flush mounted uh, sensor. Two hoses, one is heated, SEB, straps onto the struts in the airframe, and it's, it's a tunable diode laser technology. In the EAMDA program, we have nine aircraft equipped. We would love to have more, but funding is an issue because we have a, a small development budget and the National Met Services are being squeezed all the time as, as, as we, we know the economic climate in Europe. But what we would really love to see is to have an Iberian carrier flying down here and have humidity profiles. This is a seven day snapshot. As you can imagine, the nine aircraft based at Frankfurt are providing everything coming out here. But on a weekly basis, we can see the potential for a network of humidity measurements. And that's a typical uh, display. You've got your winds going up the side, temperature and dew point, which gives you an indication on, on the atmospheric conditions. So why do we need the aircraft observation data? As I mentioned, this is the, the global ob observing system. The aircraft sit in amongst all these array of uh, observation platforms, which we've heard from, from Bruno and, and Marie earlier. So in here, this is the worldwide observations. We have them at the bottom of the screen. This data feeds into the numerical models, the NWP. This is where we get the global aviation forecasts and products from. That then feeds into the operations center. Your forecaster then gets the information and he passes it to the customer. Nine times out of 10, it will be the airlines or the ATM. During all this process, we have two-way feedback for research and development. That feeds all back into NWP so we can develop and improve what we're having with this data that we have at the bottom. You may see some flights, the, the, the global SIG weather charts produced by WAFSI every six hours. This is uh, looking at the UK, this is the low land SIG weather chart and then the spot winds. All the AMDAR data is feeding into these products. Uh, I won't talk too much about this as we've got some NWP later on. Uh, and they say it's just basically, it provides both better accuracy than satellites and higher temporal coverage than radio sons. And as you can see here, with improved horizontal coverage and the use of humidity, impacts will be even greater. AMDAR data is the fourth uh, contributing factor to improvements in global models. So the impact on weather prediction, three main elements, uh, wind and temperature data, uh, similar to radio sons, fine detailed structure within the vertical profiles of ascent and descent at airports, and we can produce profiles every three hours or less because we have the capability to target airports and assign an uplink to an aircraft. We send an, an uplink to the aircraft, sorry, to the airline, and the airline uplinks that to the aircraft to say, can you switch on and report? Forecasters use the data to improve forecasts. We've, we've heard about the improvements. Uh, thunderstorm genesis, location and severity, mainly in the summer. Wind shear location intensity, I've got some examples of that. And I mentioned the fog formation and obviously precipitation of mountain rates we can actually get information from as well. Benefits of aircraft data, I've mentioned NWP, forecast applications, even climate and verification, AMDAR data is being used for as well. And the benefit to airline operations. Improved weather forecasting skill and airline ops, improved flight ops, improved safety, cost savings, that's the big one. Safety and savings, that's what you talk to an airline about nowadays. Aircraft sensor and system monitoring, we can actually provide information on the sensor uh, uh, quality control. And what I've, I've asterisked uh, the two here, and there's a, there's a study done by South African Airways, and they've actually put uh, a year's savings on their A340 wide body operations, and I can make that available if, if people are interested. It's quite an interesting read. 
So this is just a, a flow diagram of the benefits. So the, there's the AMDAR data. It goes into the National Met Services operations, your forecast verification, NWP, impact on and the products that we push. And this is where it's interesting, the impact on airline operations. We've got improvements, uh, better flight planning, etc. Um, the impact on the airline performance is there as well, but that's the big end one we're getting to. From the AMDAR data, we can give you that savings. Yeah, as I said, improved the more accurate for weather forecasts, produced uh, uh, better safety and airline operations. So how do we get the observations? This is just a, a diagram to let you know what is available out there. There's the AMDAR in red that we actually get. It's either satellite or VHF or HF uh, media. We've also got AREPS, ADS, ADS-C and ADS-B, contract and broadcast, IKO uh, development. And we're also looking at further ahead with internet capability on an aircraft. In-flight entertainment, you've all watched the maps where you've got your wind and temperature outside. Panasonic are actually taking this data and feeding it back into their computer. So, AMDA, Aircraft Meteorological Data Relay. Welcome to the world of acronyms. Yes. So basically what we can get out of an aircraft is its height, temperature, wind speed and direction. And additional parameters that we have the potential for is turbulence, icing and humidity. We're doing a lot of work on turbulence, the eddy dissipation rate uh, algorithms uh, done by NCAR in, in Colorado in the US. But with listening to uh, and trying to understand most of the conversations this morning, uh, wind shear is a possibility. Could we actually add wind shear values to an AMDA report? Something I'll be taking back and discussing with my colleagues. So uh, it's a collaborative program between the airlines and National Met Service, or it can be a regional or a global. And I say from the aircraft systems, we use the ACARS system. So basically the aircraft, SATCOM or VHF, to the ground, and then it comes out to the National Met Services onto the, what we call the GTS, which is our global telecommunications system. And basically every Met Service in the globe can have access to that information and feed it into their models, better forecasting. So not only is it for your departure airports, even your arrival airports as well can have the benefit. Uh, just a quick picture, tap probes for temperature and the pitot-static tubes for pressure. What can we get? Uh, we have various phases of flight. We have uh, takeoff, we have two ascent phases. We have the cruise level. And generally, we just have one phase of, of descent. And these can be configured uh, as much as uh, three-second reporting in ascent, one-minute reporting en route, and 10 seconds uh, on uh, descent as well. It's all, done, it's all down to the ARINC 620 uh, industry standard uh, software. So, what does an airline need to do? Uh, a very basic diagram of what's on board. You've got your data acquisition system in the middle, and these values uh, from the air data computers on board. One, we can take these values, the temperature, wind speed, direction, and the altitude. Very simple one, the clock, we can get the time from. So we know the time of the observation and all the parameters are there. So how do we, WMO, the National Met Service, or a regional collaboration, know if you've got the right software? We identify an airline that uh, is of interest, uh, and we initiate discussions with the airline and the National Met Service representatives. We involve the National Met Service of the country, because they speak the language. It's a lot better. Uh, we then issue an avionics questionnaire. They fill this in for us with all the fleet details. And this provides information of whether the airlines can be switched on or we have to do some sort of development. These uh, links are all on this WMO uh, AMDAR website. Very informative. It tells you all about the benefits of uh, AMDAR, what an airline needs to do, the building blocks, etc. There's lots of documentation there. So this is the airline compatible survey that we send out. And this is just a snapshot of the Honeywell com compatible AOC hardware. So we ask for the hardware part number, the core software, and from this information, we can find out if the AMDAR, if, sorry, if the airline and the aircraft are AMDAR capable, and we can actually process. 
the software we, we use, another fantastic acronym that we have come up with, AMDAR Onboard Software Functional Requirements Specification. The AOSFRS, yes. r 620 was so much easier. Uh, but it's based on the r 620 and it gives us a lot more flexibility with the, what we can do with an airlink, uh, sorry, an airline uplink as well. Once we have AMDAR developed on an aircraft, we carry out testing. Uh, makes sense. We have uh, the airline that generates a, a test weather message uh, from the, mod the, the MET module within the software, and it's routed to a data processing system. It could be at the airline, or it could be using the eAMDAR system, or even the US system at NOAA. Airline is then integrated into the data processing system. This is a typical, uh, that's the, the eAMDAR address. That's a typical WXM message. And it's basically gobbledygook. You know, it's not understandable. I can read most of it. But the, it's almost like Spanish to me. Yeah. And, uh, but uh, yeah, so what we can do is once we receive this raw message, it's a, what we used to call a CETA type B message. And basically we can decode it. And apologies for my Ryanair colleagues in the, the room, but this is an easy jet aircraft example. Uh, basically it just gives us the phase of flight, the ascent, the time, the latitude, longitude, its actual height and feet, air temp, wind direction, wind speed, and if it has a turbulence indicator as well. So the stakeholders involved are airlines. So we have a focal point with an airline. Uh, we try, try and get in touch with the engineering department, the data link, the operation dispatch, the people who are at the hard, end, hard edge of the, the operations. We will involve managers, but we prefer to talk to the, the, the people down, down, down in, downstairs, as it were. National Met Services, as with the airline, we identified focal points and they capture the national MET requirements as well. And uh, as I mentioned, the uh, advantage of speaking the language. Uh, data service providers, uh, in addition to the software, the airline provides information on who they use. And normally it's either Rockwell Collins, or used to be Arink, and CETA, CETA on air. Uh, we also have uh, good relations with the avionics vendors, Rockwell, Honeywell, Teledyne, and others. And we also represent AMDAR uh, globally at avi avionics forums. For example, they are the AWEC Data Link Users Forum twice a year. Aviation industry, we have got collaboration. Uh, we've just recently uh, developed a, a concept of operations with IATA. Their members, uh, 260 airlines, came to IATA and asked, could we start a turbulence repository? Could we get turbulence data and have it available for use with all the airlines? So WMO, uh, myself, and IATA, uh, my colleagues, are all looking at this potential collaboration of IATA and WMO. I can provide a presentation that gives you information on the, the collaboration if anybody is interested. ICAO, we've heard mentioned for ADS and uh, policy issues. AWEC for industry standards, uh, as I mentioned, the DLUF. WMO, we used myself and others, uh, experts within expert teams on aircraft-based observations. Uh, this provides assistance with software issues to the National Met Services and the airlines. It helps develop a national or a regional program. And we have good relationships, as I mentioned, with all the industry players. Benefits for a regional collaboration, uh, I mentioned the EAMDAR is one of these. The immediate benefits is you can have shared costs. So, for instance, if Spain, Portugal, France all got together and, and, and tried to do a sort of regional program within a regional program, this might be of benefit and might help uh, develop things. Uh, as I said, with a regional program, we've already shown that we can actually have a data processing system to handle 14 plus uh, other aircraft. Uh, we will be testing the Kenya aircraft when they come online uh, at the end of July this year. Development of optimization system and quality evaluation done by the one National Met Service or the one member responsible for the EAMDAR program. Negotiations on data costs with participating airlines. As I mentioned, we pay for the data comms costs. Uh, it varies from airline to airline depending on their contract with their data service provider. Perhaps we could actually have a stronger voice and try and say, this is the playing field that we want to be in. Uh, and as I say, we have a combined voice in the region. So other aircraft-based observation uh, platforms, uh, Mode S system, uh, you've got the three elements here. Uh, your primary radars, the pulse back to the aircraft, the secondary radar systems, there's a transport, transponder on board the aircraft, and Mode S, this is a selective communication to an airframe and ground station. 
What can we get from a Modesta in meteorological data? Uh, MRAR, Meteorological Routine Air Report. Not every aircraft will be contracted to give this. We need to have this BDS 4.4 and BDS 4.5 from the air traffic control, sending that information to the aircraft. Can we have a MET report? Bandwidth is a big issue. What we could look at is, is there anything that we can actually perhaps not have and replace it with weather? Because weather data is pretty important. Uh, in the UK, we have uh, put uh, uh, aerials and uh, receivers on, on our ra uh, weather radar sites. Uh, basically, you can perhaps see this is Ireland. This is obviously the Heathrow area, uh, Manchester Way, uh, Dublin and Belfast. But what we've done is we've put this, uh, these five sensors and we're hoping to expand uh, in, into to Europe with uh, the KNMI. Who are, develop who are developing this EMAD DC. This is European Meteorological Aircraft Derived Data Center. So it's looking at the MODES and ADS data as well. So business case for this, and hopefully by 2020, there will be a module within the, the, the EAMDAR program. What we can get from this is, uh, this is a 10-minute latest wind at uh, Gatwick uh, in London. And basically, this is just looking at MODES data that's come in. So it's almost like a wind profiler. And if we zoom in for the, to the first uh, sort of 1,500 feet, we can actually get wind profilers from the aircraft that are flying in, MODES equipped, of course. This is a potential for a MODES uh, extended uh, uh, squitter in Europe. And as you can see, there is coverage down in the Canaries here. So we'd like one in Madeira as well, but uh, beggars can't be choosers. So ADSC, uh, we heard uh, ICAO mentioned in a few uh, presentations uh, previously. It uses the same aircraft systems to transmit. It's a contract with the air airline and the air traffic control. Transmits data to one or more specific ATSUs, the air traffic service units, or the AOC facilities for surveillance. Uh, it used to be the, like the old waypoint reporting. Data is generated in response to a request uh, under the terms of the ADS contract that the airline have. And it co the contract itself identifies the types of information conditions it needs to report. As it says here, some types of information are included in every report, while other types are provided only if specified by an ADS contract. And it can send emergency reports as well. We heard uh, ICAO uh, Annex 3 here. Uh, it's uh, Chapter 5 that uh, is interesting for, for meteorological terms. And it's also in this Manual of Aeronautical Meteorological Practice. Under, AD, under ICAO Annex 3, ADSC data reports. It's a recommendation that uh, those with mode S... Uh, can't read it yet, again every 15 minutes during en route, and every 30 seconds on climb. It's an ADS, ADSC recommendation from my ICAO. We know that not every airline is doing it, and we're missing a lot of data, as you'll see in the next few slides. NOAA and Rockwell Collins have a contract with each other to receive and process all Rockwell customer data, uh, ADSC data. Prior to this arrangement, none of this had any quality control on it. So the data was being given to air traffic controls. It was then being sent to WAFCs, and it was put into the products with no quality control. And what this quality control that we now have identified some data issues. Uh, the Boeing 787 ADSC data had a reciprocal wind. So instead of 360, you were getting 180. So there was a lot of uh, uh, wrong wind information from the 787s. This is the coverage. Uh, mainly in the US. As you can see, there's a cutoff point. Because the US carriers are not interested in here. They've, got, they've done what they want to do. That's the handover from Gander to Shanwick or Gander to Santa Maria. Uh, so, what do we do? As you see, this is a, an average number of observations in a 24 hour period. You can see the large numbers over the North Atlantic. Very little here as well. So, 
EAMDA, we are having discussions with CETA on air uh, to try and implement a similar arrangement in the US with CETA customers. Currently looking at data processing options, and it will probably be that the data from the ADSC equipped aircraft or reporting aircraft will be uh, addressed to my system, the EAMDA system, and we will process them onto the GTS and they will be carried out QC as is done by NOAA. Uh, AFERS is uh, an alternative, it's a third party package. Uh, it's done by a company in Canada called Flight, and it's basically it's a small box on board. Instead of having full blown ACARs on your fleet, you have this little box, uh, AFERS 228, I think it's called. Uh, leading provider uses Iridium SATCOM, uh, global flight tracking, live flight, data, sorry, live flight data recording streaming capability, and it also has aircraft monitoring solutions for the, the health of your aircraft. Specifically designed to enhance op, op control, dispatch reliability and safety, and also reduction in operational costs. They have more than 50, 70 customers worldwide. That includes airlines and uh, the aircraft manufacturers as well. Uh, as I said, it's Iridium based SATCOM, uses proprietary software to acquire and transmit the data to the ground in near real time, similar to the AMDAR and it's processed and distributed to the customer using their own ground server network. And it also has expandable uh, interface capabilities. This is where we have developed with AFERS to have the MET module included. Quick schematic uh, from the aircraft uh, to, to, this, uh, to the VHF ground station or the SATCOM, back to the, the uptime server at flight, and then it gets passed to the customers, the airlines, the air traffic control, etc. Uh, they are certified by Canada, America, Europe, uh, China, and I think that's Brazil uh, for all of the Airbus uh, 320 family. A means accepted and I means in progress. So these STCs, uh, supplementary type certificates, are all been given to AFERS, uh, to flight company, to install this box on these aircraft type. Just a, a rehash of that uh, we're, we're looking at this as well now, as, as well as all the other aircraft based observation platforms we have, we have this potential for internet based uh, uh, reporting. So the bit you've all been waiting on. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this is a, a one week snapshot of AMDAR data into the region. It looks very good, but it's seven days. So we just have, uh, as I mentioned, we have them optimized for one profile every three hours. So at Tenerife, if an AMDAR equipped aircraft is flying into Tenerife and it fits that criteria of one profile every three hours, it will report. So this is a, a, the same snapshot, but it's by airline. So as, as you can see, uh, this is easy jet flights. And we also have uh, German wings, uh, some SAS, uh, Lufthansa flight in here as well. If we were to have funding and we could equip, uh, sorry, optimize uh, TFS or LPA uh, for hourly reporting, it wouldn't just be the EasyJet flights you'd see down here. You'd see all the other airlines that are coming in. So if you look at your flight schedule on your arrivals at Tenerife South, you can, and if they are one of the 14 airlines that are EAMD are equipped, we can actually provide a profile. I did try and set up an example in the system for me to, to show you a live demonstration, but I configured it wrong. I managed to get Saturday evening from 1600 to the end of flying, there were five profiles. But uh, I, I can show that live if somebody wants to see it. This is a, it's a typical uh, product we have in our EAMDAR portal, which is available to airlines and national met services. It's just a password. Uh, so basically this is a prof uh, profile progression, it's a rolling 24 hour period, so you can see this at a three hourly uh, assignment that we have for, for TFS. If you went hourly, this is Frankfurt. So this is a sort of win profile that you could actually get if we, if we had hourly profiles of equipped aircraft coming into Tenerife. Uh, I'm going to show a couple of examples. Uh, the one I haven't got here is my colleague in New Zealand Met Service. They are using AMDAR data in their uh, TAFs and SIGMETs uh, 
uh, quite a lot, uh, a big reliance on the data, especially at uh, Queenstown, which has the Southern Alps to the, uh, to the south and a lot of uh, wind shear and turbulence uh, issues. So AMDAR are ideal for identifying and forecasting low-level wind shear, forecast turbulence over broad areas. The data are used frequently by National Weather Service. This is my colleague in the US. And here are a few examples from Chicago, Anchorage in Alaska, and Honolulu. Yeah, uh, and I think there was an illusion earlier on that, uh, the, that on the American website you can actually see the discussions from each National Weather Service. And this one here says that given that recent AMDAR soundings out of Chicago are already indicating around 50 knots of wind around 2,500 feet, low-level wind shear will continue to be an issue at least through and around 1 a.m. tonight. So there was a wind shear warning issued for Chicago Airport on the strength of an AMDAR data. And as you can see, there's a 50-knot there's a wind there at the low levels. Uh, Anchorage. AMDAR is very important, the Anchorage uh, main fo uh, weather forecast office. Uh, it's a twice daily radio songs, midnight and 1200. Don't really provide that coverage uh, to give you real time information. Uh, they used AMDAR on uh, 2012 in September to monitor the lowering of strong southeast winds aloft, which created over 60 knots of wind shear, lowest 2,000 feet. So the progression here, uh, as you can see, the first one was at 138, 551, and 834. And then you can actually see the winds aloft here increasing, or sorry, decreasing as the day went on. So from 4,500 feet down to 2,200 feet, you had these strong winds, you know, and also noticed the direction of shear as well. So basically what they were saying at Anchorage that takeoffs on the runways uh, will go from headwind to tailwind. Uh, so basically what they said was it's currently not safe to fly into or out of Anchorage International Airport. So basically the flights that they, they cancelled, 500 passengers were on board, unhappy passengers no doubt, but as you say the weather played a big factor, but the AMDAR data helped the forecasters make that decision with air traffic and the airlines. Uh, at Honolulu, uh, winds this uh, AMDAR data again, 30 knots of wind within a few thousand feet of the surface, a weak inversion, winds this strong should still support turbulence in the lee of the mountains, and an air met is in effect for moderate low-level turbulence. Again, based on the AMDAR profiles. Some of you will remember this one. Yeah, thousands of Brits, yeah, left stranded at airports as powerful storm batters the Canary Islands. And as you can see, we had some AMDAR data into uh, the islands here. And this was the descent sounding into Las Palmas. And as you can see, significant speed and directional wind shear. These are all the wind barbs. So you're looking at, you know, a lot of wind there, which, as you say, caused that chaos and disruption. So what we can do with the AMDAR is hopefully uh, is, is provide that uh, overview to let you see how important AMDAR data is uh, to the airlines and the operations. And if we had more airlines in the Iberian Peninsula flying down this way or more airlines that serve the Canaries, we could actually equip and uh, just a final couple of slides, Hong Kong Observatory, uh, there was a mention of it in a previous presentation. Uh, the potential to use near real-time AMDAR, ascent descent data for wind shear alerting. Prelim results indicated that AMDAR temperature profiles are able to reveal low-level inversions and low-level jets. So they supplement the radius on descent profiles. And apart from windy situations, even light winds uh, at Hong Kong can, can pr provide this uh, presence of low-level temperature inversion. Uh, there we go. Yeah, in fact, wind shear has been known to occur even when winds are less than 15 knots blow across the hills on Lantau Island. 2005, they uh, conducted experiments in applying AMDAR observations into their uh, reporting at Hong Kong International. Uh, the wind shear experienced by the aircraft uh, from high resolution AMDAR reports, they actually configured them, the Hong Kong, so the Cathay Pacific aircraft, for three second reporting on takeoff. And basically, the AMDAR wind report showed good agreement with the FDR data in respect of the altitude and the headwind. 
In particular, AMDA data at four second resolution was able to capture the significant headwind variations uh, associated with uh, low level wind shear. So what they've done is they've configured the aircraft for three seconds there. Uh, and basically the AMDA wind observations from the ascending aircraft has been developed that actually automate, automatically generates a wind shear report from the Cathay Pacific aircraft. And as, as mentioned in the previous slide, since 2006, AMDA wind shear reports have been included in their warnings to air traffic management. And just to uh, give you an indication here, during the uh, Typhoon Canon on October 2017, these are the heights, uh, the wind speed, uh, the wind direction, and then the headwind component. As you can see, a wind shear report from a pilot received at 1027, as opposed to 1022 profile, confirmed the presence, location, and magnitude of the wind shear as well. And that's it. Thank you very much.